So the other day I was sitting at my computer while eating a cookie and watching some YouTube and I came across a video from a guy named Phil. This Phil guy was apparently trying to climb a climb in Spain as quick as he possibly could and when he got to the top of the climb he said This is the hardest leaderboard I've attempted on my channel. It's all world tour. If you're under 30 minutes, uh, you're the real deal. While I was watching the video I thought to myself I like to climb hills quickly. I live in Spain. So that set off a chain of events that then led me to the position I'm in now filming this video. In today's episode of Tristan Take Video, I'm racing the fastest cyclist in the world up one of Spain's hardest climbs and I'm taking you guys along for the journey with me. Now a couple of disclaimers that I do want to make before we get into this episode and that is that firstly the difficulty of a climb is dependent on who you're racing up, not the climb itself. Even the steepest climbs in the world can be conquered with a very easy gear on your bike. But if you want to go quick, the climb becomes a lot harder. The second disclaimer I want to make is that this episode is not some triumphant win over the best world tour cyclists out there, showing how good I am and breaking power records and trying to get a world tour contract along the way. It's simply the journey of how I trained, who I spoke to, how I set up my bike and how I went and tried to climb one of my home road climbs as quick as I could. At the end of this episode, I'm also going to speak to the cyclist who took the KOM the same day that I went for my attempt and get his thoughts on how he did it, how much power he put out, what he felt like when he was going up there, and how much of a toll it took on his body. So with all that being said, let's jump into today's episode, and that is how I raced some of the best cyclists in the world up one of Spain's hardest climbs. Okay, so let's get into the crux of this story and why I wanted to make this episode. Now, if you guys have been following me for a little while now, you'll know that I live in Girona in Catalonia, Spain. This is a small town in the northeastern corner of Spain that's become increasingly popular with cyclists. There are a few famous climbs around here, the most of which is Rocacorba. It's a steep climb about 15 kilometers north of Girona that was apparently asked to be paved by Lance Armstrong when he lived here. Whether this story is true or not, I have no idea, but that was the rumor that I heard. The official segment for the climb on Strava is 9.9 kilometers, averaging 7.4%. You gain 745 meters while you climb it, but there's more to this climb than simply the 9.9 kilometers at 7.4% stat that you see when you look on Strava. The climb itself basically has three different parts. It's got the first part when you cross the bridge that averages around five to 6% for the first couple of kilometers. You go around a corner and slightly downhill for a few hundred meters before the road really kicks up to a section of about eight or nine percent for the next kilometer and a half. After that small section, you've got about a one kilometer stretch of flat. Now, a lot of people will say that flat in the middle of a climb is great because you can recover. The difficulty with flat on a climb like this and wanting to go as quick as you can is the fact that in order to keep moving at a high speed, you need to push quite a lot of power and you never actually get the rest that you're hoping for. After that section of flat comes what I consider the most difficult part of the climb and that is the middle four kilometers. This four kilometers averages around 10% the entire way and it doesn't let off at all. It's extremely easy to blow up in this middle section and lose a whole bunch of time. So measuring your effort here is incredibly important. After that four kilometer section at 10%, you hit another flat section where again, you can't ease off the pedals before you start the final 1.5 kilometers all the way up to the line. The last 1.5 kilometers are especially difficult when you're trying to go quick up Rocacorba because they average around 10%. By the time you reach the line, you're well into your maximum heart rate. Why I consider this climb so difficult is because it requires multiple different styles of riding. You need to be good going up gradual uphills. You need to be good going up steep uphills. You need to be able to maintain your power once you're over onto the flat and you need to be able to measure your effort for at least 30 minutes. Why I consider Rocacorba such a mythological beast is the fact that I've been going there for the last eight years and I've never been able to crack the under 30 minute mark. I've been riding all over Europe for the past eight years and I'm in the top 1% of what most people consider the most iconic 
iconic and potentially most difficult climbs on Strava. None of these climbs and on none of these attempts was I made to suffer as much as I suffered trying to do this attempt up Rocacorba, and that's why I consider this climb one of the hardest in Spain. Yo, alrighty, so it is Thursday afternoon. It's the 18th of May. I've got seven days until the Rocacorba climb challenge. And over the next seven days, I'm gonna show you what I'm doing in the lead up to actually doing this climb. I've actually been off the bike the last few days. I was in Madrid the last two days visiting some family. And prior to that, I was up in Andorra off the bike, having a bit of recovery time, downtime after a good block of racing. And then in the lead up to the Rocacorba challenge, I'm doing a few intense sessions that have been set for me by my coach, John Wakefield, who you will have seen in some previous episodes. We're gonna have a chat with him later in this episode about the actual Rocacorba climb and what he thinks I can do on it. But for this afternoon, I'm just out for a little recovery ride. I've got 1.5 hours on my plan, just very nice and easy, warming my body up after a bit of time off the bike. I'm fresh as a daisy at the moment. I'm gonna enjoy riding on these nice smooth farm roads, head back to Drona, and then I'll document my training over the next few days. So obviously, as I've said a few times, now this climb is not only difficult because of the parkours, but it's more difficult because of the people who have gone up this climb and also how hard they've gone to get to the top. While the segment Strava leaderboard doesn't have names on it like Remco, Evenepoel, Jonas Vingegaard, Tade Pogacar, or Wout Van Aert, it does have a few notable names on it that I'm gonna talk about. The first I'm gonna speak about is Australian cyclist Jay Vine. Now Jay is an extremely good climber. We saw this all in the Vuelta España last year when he was leading the KOM classification and crashed out, unfortunately losing the polka dot jersey along the way. The reason I know Jay is one of the best climbers on earth is not just because of that race result, but is seeing the litany of Strava KOMs that he has. When Jay first turned pro a few years ago and arrived in Girona, he spent the first couple of months essentially decimating every leaderboard on every climb that he could find within Girona. Jay's KOM time of 26 minutes and 42 seconds with an average of 451 watts means that he was pushing six and a half kilos up Rocacorba when he got that KOM. Six and a half watts per kilo for 26 minutes is on the extreme upper end of what World Tour cyclists can produce, giving you an indicator that Jay was not going easy when he climbed Rocacorba for that KOM attempt. Another rider in that top 10 there is James Knox. James is an extremely talented climber from the UK who rides for Quickstep Alpha Vinyl. And the week that he did this attempt, took the KOM and set the record up Rocacorba was the same week that he was contacted by Quickstep for a professional contract. How do I know this? Because I rode with James and spoke with him a few months after he turned pro and asked him about that Rocacorba attempt. Ineos Grenadiers rider Pavel Sivakov did 27 minutes and 49 seconds for a BAM of 1590. Simon Yates, who had the original KOM back in 2016, did 28 minutes and three seconds. Next, we have Derek G. Now, Derek is a Canadian rider. You guys would all know of him. He absolutely blitzed the recent Giro d'Italia. He was in the breakaway more days than he was in the peloton. He took second on more stages than I've ever seen someone take second on in a Grand Tour and unfortunately didn't quite get that win. But his time up Rocacorba was done during an Israel Premier Tech training camp and they were obviously going full on the way up there. Finally, I wanna come up to the man who started this entire process and that is Phil Guyman. Now, obviously at the start there, I was joking. I do know who Phil Guyman is. He's an extremely good cyclist. He basically climbs, climbs for a living. He makes a bunch of YouTube videos and I wanna say, Phil, if you are watching this, Congrats for going hard. There was just one issue. When you said you came top 10 overall on Strava, you didn't actually come top 10 on the official segment. You came top 10 on a segment which started a few hundred meters earlier that not every rider in that top 10 went for. But we won't hold that against you, mate, because you did a very respectable 28 minutes and 44 seconds, averaging 375 watts for the effort, which is actually extremely good for a guy who's well into his retirement era. All righty, so out here, it is Friday afternoon, it's the 19th of May, so I've only got six days until the Rocacorba Climb Challenge. I've just ridden round to the back of Els Angels where I'm doing my efforts today that I'm gonna explain in a second. It's a bit of a rainy old afternoon. I've just rolled out, came out of Girona. It was kind of, wasn't pouring rain, but it was sprinkling, which is kind of different. We haven't had any rainy days here for a little while now. Now, John sent me quite an interesting training session today. It's four four-minute efforts at around 5.2, 5.3 watts a kilo, and four four-minute 
efforts at around six or just above six watts a kilo. So working on that sort of that VO2, that recovery, going up to around threshold and then recovering and then going much higher above threshold and then trying to recover after that. I'm gonna do it on L's and gels, which is where I do a majority of my efforts. One other thing I wanna say before I go further in this video is I don't really mention this much, but I wanna give a big, big shout out to Attacker, who is my kit sponsor. This month, it'll be six years of having Attacker sponsor me. So I've been an Attacker ambassador and athlete for the last six years. The company was actually started 11 years ago in Sydney, where I'm from, by a couple of mates. So it's really good to have them supporting me. And I try and support them by telling you guys that I have a discount code for Attacker products in the description down there. And this is not a commissioned-based thing. This is purely for the enjoyment of my subscribers. I make all my videos basically for free, apart from the advertising revenue I make from YouTube based on the amount of views I get. And also, thankfully, due to brands like Attacker and BMC that really look after me and I'll make sure I can continue to make videos like this. So with all of that being said, I'm gonna roll off, do my four minute efforts here and uh, let's get back to the video. So now, of course, we need to talk about my last attempt up Rocker Corba. So my time up Rocker Corba prior to the one that I did in this episode is 30 minutes and 14 seconds. I averaged 338 watts for the effort, around 5.4 to 5.5 watts a kilo. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but as an amateur cyclist holding this for 30 minutes, it felt like a lot. Having said that, not cracking the 30 minute barrier was a disappointment to me. I went home, I put my bike to the side and I thought, you know what, I'm not going for that Rocker Corp a 30 minute effort until I'm well prepared. For this attempt, I of course wasn't doing massive days of training, but I was doing very specific training assigned to me by my coach, John, who is a world tour coach for Bora Hansgrohe and coaches some of the best riders in the world. Alrighty, so I've come back to the science to sport lab here with John Wakefield, who's my coach, as I've just mentioned. I wanted to come and ask him some things about this Rocker Corp effort because it's not an easy effort. Say for example, you had this race in a climb. Imagine this was like one of your riders had this as a hill climb TT in a stage race or something. Yeah. How would you recommend they pace it? Yeah, so when it comes to TTs, for myself personally, I, I, I never prescribe on power. I'll look at the course and I'll see sort of what it entails and I would work out a time perspective and you have an idea of what your power and speed needs to be accordingly. But when I do kind of tell athletes and, and we are at TT days or efforts like this, it's based off more an, an RPE. And an effort like this, I would say it would be an eight and a half, nine out of 10. You sort of on threshold, just above threshold, especially for the duration. Yeah, so like when you say an eight and a half, nine out of 10, obviously that's not full gas. In is that due to the length of it? Yeah, correct. And so if it was shorter, you can obviously, as your time gets down, your, your RPE can go up because you can sustain that for a longer period of time. Mm, that makes sense. And so for me, in terms of pacing it, being a lighter rider, would you give me, like, what would you say for me to... Four, four out of 10? <laughs> no, <four. laughs> no, but I mean, as in, for the start, tell me, like, uh, for the start... For, for the start, I would have you, just because it's, it's not your strong point, I would probably have you at, a, like, eight out of 10. And just maintain it so you don't lose time and then have energy and, and have gas by the time you hit those steep ramps so you can capitalize on that yeah and then i guess the last five minutes the say the steep bit at the end yeah, is just like just, just all at 11 out of 10 11 out of 10 <laughs> yeah super deep just on that rpe you're saying i shouldn't look at the watts you don't no, think no. i should look at watts no yeah. is that because you think the watts might weird me out or yeah so two things one if on the day you're not really feeling good and we prescribe say 360 watts and it's too hard essentially you're blowing your day is over if you can do 370 watts but you're focusing on 360 essentially you do a disjustice to yourself because you can actually go faster that's why i don't I'm, I'm not a big fan of prescribing power for these efforts and that's through my whole range of that. Yeah, interesting. And that applies to flat TTs as well. Yep. You would prescribe RPE for flat TTs as well. Correct. Because yeah, essentially at the end of the day is, if it's too hard, your central governor will, will slow you down yeah. and say, this is too hard and you slow down, or if it's too easy, you've got to give gas. The scientific element comes up until the day you off the start line. Yeah, so you train to power. Correct. But then, but then on the day, you just got to go. Like I'll say, if you're three weeks at the end of a, of a grand tour, that RPE is very different than day one TT. You have to take a lot into consideration. Yeah. That makes sense. Alrighty, Saturday morning, it's the 20th of May, so I've got five days until the Rocket Corporate Challenge. As you can see, I'm just out for a little coast loop today. John has written on the program for me four hours, but he hasn't set any intervals, so no intervals today, just cruising along. What he has done in my training peaks is set me a TSS number. Now, TSS is not something that John really focuses on all that much. TSS is your training stress score. Uh, it's a measure of the entire training ride in terms of the intensity, but he has set a TSS mark in there, and so that's what I'm aiming for 
before, he's given me 160 TSS for today, uh, which on these roads with some sort of undulations and everything should be quite easy to hit, about 40 TSS per hour. A road down to the coast kind of heading sort of southeast out towards Tossa de Mar. I'm heading north along the coast road, then I'm going to head back inland towards Girona. Really nice Saturday morning roll and uh, yeah, getting closer to my big Rocker Corpa challenge. <laughs> Alrighty, now moving on into my bike setup for this attempt. Now, bike setup is obviously hugely critical for a mountain time trial like this. I was treating this like a race, and so therefore I made my bike as light as I possibly could. The bike that I rode for this attempt was my BMC T-Machine SLR01. For the attempt, I actually took off the slightly deeper race wheels that I'd been running and put on the bike my DT Swiss Mon Chasserelle climbing wheels. Now, as you'll see in this footage, I did do a bit of measuring of the wheels and the set to try and get the wheel set as light as possible because that was going to make the biggest difference on the steeper sections of the climb. By swapping out the wheels and the tires and running the light Tubalito inner tubes, I was able to save about 220 grams or so across the entire wheel set. I have spoken about the difference between running shallow versus running deep wheels and how that affects the way the bike feels, but for this attempt with the majority of the climb being at 10% or more, I wanted to have the lightest feeling bike possible and so therefore I went for those shallow wheels. In in terms of tires, I was running Pirelli P0 Race TLR tires in the 28C size. I obviously needed to film this effort for this vlog, so what I used was my GoPro session on the front of the bike there. I did actually weigh the two GoPros that I own alongside each other to see which one was lighter. The session was a fair bit lighter than the Hero 9 Black that I generally use for whacking on the front of the bike to film. I used my Aero Giro helmet for this attempt because there were a couple of sections where I'd be going quite quick and the weight savings between the Aero helmet and the more breathable helmet from Giro are not actually massive. While a majority of this climb was at quite steep gradients, that slight aerodynamic advantage on my head for those slightly faster sections, given that there was no weight penalty, was going to be a benefit. As you can see on the back of my bike there, I've got a ceramic speed oversized pulley wheel system along with a ceramic speed bottom bracket and ceramic speed lube on the chain. Now a lot of people love to jump in the comments on YouTube and hate on ceramic speed, but I can tell you that for me, these upgrades in drivetrain efficiency are worth it and do make a difference, even if it is psychological. Psychology plays a massive role in performance in sport. And so if you've got those slight marginal gains added to your bike, even if they are in your head, the difference is gonna be noticeable when you're going up a climb of this length. Alrighty, howdy, how's it going? So it is now Sunday morning. This morning I'm actually out for an interesting ride that I haven't done before. So I have got two and a half hours, just in zone two, not too hard, but fasted. Basically last night, I had to have a low carb dinner and then this morning I had to have no carbs for breakfast. I could have protein so last night for dinner I had a four egg omelette and a little salad and then this morning I had a just a black coffee so no milk in the coffee which is milk is carbohydrates obviously so no carbohydrates this morning no carbohydrates last night and then today I'm doing two and a half hours just at a steady zone two. It's not a difficult ride but what it is designed to do is get your body to process fuel in a different way. In terms in terms of the actual ride that I'm doing today, I'm going on a bit of a sort of long Bagnolas loop, kind of flat undulating roads, nothing too serious, no steep climbs. And the reason for that is, is because I don't want to spike my power up into the zone three and zone four. The issue with spiking your power up is that it, it starts burning through fuel a lot more quickly. It's unsustainable and it's not the purpose of this ride. So I'm just doing these sort of undulating roads out towards Bagnolas. And uh, yeah, I'm going to enjoy this next couple of hours, a little bit rainy, but it's all good. As John once famously said, your skin is waterproof. So I'll get this two and a half hour ride done and uh, head home. Alrighty, cool. So uh, when it comes to doing the actual climb, like yeah. my goal is sub 30 minutes. Obviously I want to go as fast as possible. Sub yeah. 30 minutes up Rocky Corbett is something I've never done before. Can you give me from a professional perspective or a scientific perspective, what do you think I need to do as an athlete to get myself up there in terms of like power numbers or... Power wise, you would probably look at like uh, three... 355, 360, I think, around there. And then just from a van perspective to follow on to that, if you're doing 5.7, 5.8 watts a kilo, you would probably be on about a 1450 VAM. 
give or take. Okay. Maybe 1500 if you're on a good day. And that's like sort of comparing to the other guys who've done it at similar times and also knowing, yeah, the, knowing, knowing the climb. climb and just kind of working it backwards in terms of what's sustainable for that sub 30 effort. Yeah. Knowing you and yeah, just kind of calculating gradients and, and time perspective on yeah, that. Cool. Yo, alrighty, howdy, welcome to today's ride. Today is Tuesday, it's the day before the Rocket Corba Challenge. I'm a bit nervous for it, I have to say. I'm out for a two and a half hour, very easy ride today. It's only in zone one, but then I've got four 15 second maximal sprints at the end of it. John has been giving me this session before my races because it's a good way to just give your body a bit of a, a sort of warm up without doing any additional proper stress to your body before the intensity of an effort or a race. Yesterday was Monday and I actually had the day off, so my body's super fresh right now. Today's ride is a warm up and I've got max freshness before doing this 30 minute combination of threshold and VO2 at Rocco Corba, which I'm, I'm quite nervous about. The reason I'm quite nervous about it is because even though it's not a race, my time up there currently is pretty good. And I'm a bit nervous about doing all of this, kind of coming up with this concept to do a vlog about this and then not going better. So while I'm filming this on Tuesday and tomorrow's the actual challenge up Rock Corba, I don't know what my time is gonna be. If you guys are watching this in the video, Hopefully I've gone one better. I guess you're going to find out shortly. Um, but yeah, the last time I did my time, my 30 minutes and 15 seconds, it was after an Everesting on Mont Ventoux and then a lot of time at altitude. So I was very used to climbing. But what I have now, which is totally different, is although I haven't been doing a lot of climbing lately, I've been doing a lot of high intensity efforts, as you would have seen the four minutes that I did the other day and all the intensity that I've done leading up to the races that I've done recently where I've gone quite well. And I've also had a lot of downtime. John is really focused on giving me proper rest in between the sessions so my body's actually been quite fresh so it's going to be interesting to see how I go. As I keep saying I am quite nervous because I do want to go one better and uh, I don't want to fail on this so let's see. <laughs> my, my next my last question for you is like knowing me having seen me ride for the last three months yeah. seeing my training every day and you've set my training and seen what numbers I can and can't do. Do you actually think I can do this? Like, do you, is this a reality? Is it a possible? Yeah, I think so. Like I, I genuinely <laughs> do. Like if, if your head's in it and, and, you, and, you, and you're happy to go that deep, I, like I believe that last sort of five, seven minutes is gonna be the deal breaker. So if you kind of really bite the bullet and, and go deep, uh, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Don't know if I'd stand here otherwise, but uh, I, 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 I do believe you can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see if the coaching has paid off and if I can actually <laughs> <Pressure>. do it. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Alrighty. So time for me to go out and get this climb done. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's and a pleasure. All the always. advice for this. We'll, uh, yeah. See if we can get it done. Alrighty. So it is Wednesday morning. It's the day of the Rocker Corba challenge. Woken up a little bit nervous, uh, like I was saying yesterday, and also woken up with a slight tickle in my throat. I don't know if it's psychological, but I feel like I've got the tiniest bit of a cold coming on. I'm starting with the excuses real early, but no, it's, it's yeah, I've woken up with this slight tickle, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to go and send this thing. We'll see how I go. We've got perfect weather, which is super nice because it's been raining for like the last number of days. I got rained on yesterday just after I spoke about those sprints, but then it cleared up in the afternoon and today is super beautiful. It looks like the wind is probably not too strong and also it's from the right direction for Rocker Corba. Not that it matters too much because of how steep Rocker Corba is. The main thing for me was just having dry roads because it's so steep and I'm going to get out of the saddle that much and push super hard, especially in that last kilometer and a half. But I wanted the road to be dry so I'm not slipping. I'm really hoping it has dried up, but we'll see. Rocker Corb is also very, very shady, so there's a chance the road will be wet, but I'll just have to roll with it. I'm not usually one for banging out big efforts early in the morning, but uh, time to go and get it done, so let's do it. Okay, so out here on the road to Banyolas, I'm actually taking the shorter way out to Banyolas and Rocker Corba today. As I keep saying, I'm... <laughs> Real nervous about this one. It's wild how nervous you can get combining trying to do a hill climb as fast as you can. One that you haven't set a decent time on for four years and also trying to film a vlog. I find that part of it also really difficult pulling out my phone because every time I look at my phone and every time I speak, I feel like I'm talking to a whole audience. I feel like I have an entire audience watching me, which is you guys, which you are now, but on the day of filming, there's no one around. I'm in the middle of nowhere by myself and uh, I'm just talking to my phone. So it's an interesting little sort of psychological phenomena that goes on in my brain when I'm filming a vlog. But uh, yeah, so I'm on my way out to Rocket Corba now doing the warm up that John's given me. So I'm just about to start my next little four minute effort. I'll keep rolling and uh, get out towards the climb chat to you just before the start. 
Okay, so just coming up to the base of the climb now, I've just gone and stashed my water bottle and my saddlebag in the bush. I went to put a little nose thing on, one of those breathable nose things that's designed for sleeping that I mentioned in the power testing video, but I put it on and because of the sweat on my nose, it just didn't stick and I had to pull it off. So that's really annoying. I was hoping that thing was gonna kick in and help, but I guess there's none of that today. Having said that, the wind is from the right direction pretty much. It's gonna be a slight headwind for the last couple of Ks, but otherwise the wind is fine. It's a little bit windier than expected and it's also warmer than expected. It's about 28 degrees down here, so starting to warm up, but I think as I climb up to that sort of five, six, seven, 800 meter mark and towards the top at 900 meters, it should cool down a little bit. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go and give this one a red hot crack. <laughs> Crazy nervous, but it's a good challenge. Uh, about to roll into it now. I will see you guys on the other side. Alrighty, so as you can see there, that was actually the deepest I've ever gone up a climb. I haven't actually gone that hard in a race, I don't think. The only time you could do an effort like this really is in a hill climb time trial because the gradient of the climb keeps you working hard. There's no time to ease off and an effort like this takes you to your absolute extreme. That day the heat actually got me more than I expected and I made a couple of small mistakes along the way, like not filling a bottle with a tiny bit of water just to have while I was midway through the climb and also simply starting too late. I should have started it earlier in the day when it was not so hot. Now I'm sure if you guys are up to this point in the video, you're like, shut up already and just tell us the damn time that you did up the climb. The irony of this entire attempt and the irony of trying to do something to Strava is this. When I went up the climb, I was going full gas. You can see that I went 100% when I finished and crossed the line. I did my best ever power for this amount of time. When I crossed the line, I pressed lap. I came to a complete stop as far as I could go on the road. But then when I got home and uploaded my ride, my attempt was not on there. Well, the attempt was on there, but it said that I did 38 minutes, when actually when I crossed the line, I had done 29 minutes and 37 seconds. As you can see, I went as far to the end of the road as I could possibly go. There was no chance that the segment could have kept going and I stopped before the end of it. But what I did later learn when analyzing the segment on Strava was that as I stopped at the fence, the segment itself does a U-turn and the segment ends after you've done a U-turn and rolled about a meter back 
back from the fence. The reason I know this is because when you deep dive into the very final part of the segment, I come to a stop, there's an eight minute stop, which was when I lay on the ground there. And as soon as I move the bike again to leave, the segment ends. I have emailed Strava about this and they haven't got back to me. I assume it's because if you don't finish the segment, there's simply nothing they can do about it. What is frustrating about the whole thing is that when I did my previous time, I didn't even roll all the way to the fence and the segment ended. I believe this might partially be to do with the two radio towers at the top of Rocker Corbett that interfere with GPS, or it's simply just one of those GPS errors when measuring on a climb. So while my time on my Wahoo did say 29 minutes, 37 seconds, as they say, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. My attempt up Rocker Corbett this day is not listed on Strava as my fastest attempt ever, and I still haven't gone under 30 minutes on the climb. What was also quite ironic about this day that I did this attempt was that on the way up, I passed a rider from Human Powered Health called Paul Double. Now you guys might remember Paul from an episode that I made in December about how he turned pro with Human Powered Health. Paul actually went up the climb just before me and he was coming down while I was on the way up. When I got home and uploaded my ride to Strava and had a look through a number of the segments on there, Paul was listed not only as the fastest climber that day, but also the fastest climber overall. And it blew my mind that just 15 minutes before I reached reached the top, young Paul Double had gone out and smashed the KOM himself, taking it off J Vine by a solid 30 seconds. So sitting here with Paul Double, I thought we'd catch up with Paul just to have a chat about the KOM effort that he did this morning. First of all, thanks so much for coming to see me. It's nice, it's nice to hang out. Coffee. Yeah, all good. Last time Paul and I caught up was actually in January at the Human Powered Health training camp. But since then you've overcome your, your finger and you've done Tour of Hungary and uh, Tour of Sicily. Yep. And then you're obviously on some pretty good form now. Yeah, so uh, well, I thought I was in on good form before all the racing started and then I think uh, the lack of race legs weren't, weren't quite there. But uh, Hungary, I showed some signs and barring a disaster on one of the stages, uh, yeah, I was I was kind of feeling a little bit better about my racing. So. Yeah, yeah. So tell me specifically about this segment. Were you going to 100% this morning? Yeah, yeah. So Max, the uh, coach, just said go up there and go as hard as you can. Uh, to be honest, <laughs> didn't expect to go as, as fast as Jay Vine. We all know like how good yeah, he how is. How good he is. So yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a bit of a nice surprise. But it was 100% to the top. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, maybe you could find five, ten seconds if you do a few things. But I think you know, everyone's flat out when they're going that fast up, up the climb, you know? Yeah, and you did, Paul did like six, we worked out about 6.6 .6 watts a kilo for, or 6.7, you weigh about 57 kilos, yeah? Yeah, 50, 56, 57. Did you have any sort of pacing strategy uh, to hit the climb today? Yeah, so well, I, I knew the length of the climb, knew roughly the power I, I thought I could do for that. Probably did more in the end. Uh, you did more power? More than I expected. It wasn't far, far off my 20 minute best, so. So you held the same number for your 26 minute effort as you would for basically your 20 minute? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say. Yeah, you, you have a rough power in mind, but because it's it's got the up and down and the, there's a few downhills, kind of save on the, on the easier parts and then push a bit more on the steeper parts. You know, I was going out there to do a, a flat out effort, but also to try and go as fast as I can up the climb. So were you pacing it, like were you doing any pacing based on power or were you just looking at speed or were you just going to rate of perceived exertion? No, I was I was looking at the power. I don't know, you can just, just feel when it's when you're going fast in the right place. You can see the gradient and you know when you're going fast in the, in the right places. Yes. But yeah, you're, you're looking at the power quite quite regularly. Yeah, interesting. And was this a segment or did you go out today wanting to get the KOM or had you just kind of been like, I'm just gonna go and ride it, see what I can do. You did quite a good effort the other day on a mare, another climb in Girona, which is like a very sought after climb and you went, you were quite close, but then today were you like, I want the KOM or? Yeah, just Max said, just go as hard as you can and see what you can do up there. There was no, no expectation, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I thought I might be quite close because on a mare, I think I was like a minute off, yeah. um, but I had, my, my friend lent me some, some lighter wheels for today, so <clears throat> I thought I might get closer, but I didn't expect to, to go so take fast. Take the KOM. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for checking in with us. And, uh, no, nice to see you. Good work for that KOM. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sweet. Cheers, guys. Now, as I keep saying, the irony of all of this is that I'm not listed on the leaderboard at my true time for the official Strava segment up Rocker Corba. But if you do look on some of the other Strava segments around there, you'll see that I went pretty quick that day and I definitely set some PRs. No, I didn't go close to Jay Vine, Paul Double, James Knox, Pavel Sivakov, Derek G, or even Phil Guyman, but I wasn't that far off. And for me, while I do feel like potentially I could go quick in future. I was happy with the entire process of setting myself a goal, training for it, using the skill that I had at the time and going and setting myself a good time up a climb on home roads. 
Having said all of that, if I do cherry pick out a segment on Strava that's just slightly longer than the official segment and have a look at the leaderboard, I am actually top 10 there, along with some of the best names in cycling. I'll see you guys in another episode of Tristan Take Video very soon. All right guys, and eagle.